Okay, so um, good morning. Um, so continuing with our, uh, our tour through statistics and machine learning. Um, so uh, I left actually the stuff that was on board uh, up to just kind of do a little recap and also if anyone wanted to uh, ask some questions from yesterday because I know there was a, you know, we went through a lot and it uh, ended towards the end. Um, so <clears throat> that's fine. Um, the, uh, just to recap a couple of the things that we had talked about, um, a lot of uh, a lot of this was still kind of based on if someone essentially gives you a statistical model, which I was calling you know p of x given theta, and so if you have this model uh, p of x given theta, there's the um, uh, there are various things you might want to do. So we talked about, for instance, the the goal of estimation, parameter estimation, and the idea there was that someone uh, you get some data x. And, you, and then you want to use that, you know, your model in some way to try to estimate the, the value of, the true value of theta that generated the data. And our notation for that was theta hat of x, which is some generic function of the data. Um, uh, and uh, this is called an estimator. And we were trying to talk about the properties of estimators without being specific about how you go about doing it. And so we, we talked about ideas of bias which is essentially how the average value of your, your estimator is different from the true value. The idea of variance, which is how much that estimator is spread around its own average. And then the idea of mean squared error, which is how different is that estimator from the true value, um, uh, you know, squared, which can decompose into this uh, bias and variance. Um, so uh, there was that idea. We also, uh, there's this bound called the kramer rao bound that says that the if you have an unbiased estimator which means you know uh, so it means on average it's going to get you back the the, the true value um that its variance uh, can't be smaller than a certain amount okay and so the this is the result is that the variance of your estimator has to be bigger than this uh this uh this quantity that's related to what what's called the fisher information and that generalizes uh, not just to when you have a single parameter that you're trying to estimate, but if you have multiple parameters you're trying to estimate. Um, so, so this means that there's like a fundamental bound on how well you could, for instance, measure the top mass and the W mass, or how well you could measure some cosmological constants of nature. Um, and uh, that's related to this Fisher information matrix. And this Fisher information matrix, um, it, when you, in the kind of, uh, multivariate form where theta has you know multiple uh, components um, so the ijth component of the, of this information matrix uh, you, you're taking the, the the log likelihood function this is this equation takes a little bit of time to parse because um, uh, so here you when you look at this function you should be thinking you know get some data X uh, plug it in here think of it as a function of the parameter theta and then you're taking the derivative of it with respect to theta I and the same thing with respect to theta j. So that's going, so this is, you know, for a fixed value of the data, this is a function that has, with the, where you can evaluate these derivatives, but now you want to imagine uh, sort of sampling lots and lots of different data sets uh, out of your statistical model. And to know how to sample that data set, you need to know the true value of theta. So given the true value of theta, you can use that to generate a bunch of uh, fake data x, and you can plug it into here, and for each of those, you can take these derivatives. Um, and so it's a, if you actually wanted to go about computing it in a kind of naive way, this would be like, like with Monte Carlo, this would be a very expensive thing. You'd have to generate some toy data, plug it into X, take the derivatives, uh, and then do that over and over and over again. Uh, but uh, if you have a, you know, a simple um, model that's like analytic, you might be able to take these uh, derivatives and expectations uh, uh, analytically. Anyway, so this is the... So this is the you know the the result. A lot of time, a lot of times it's written in this form, where if you think of it as a second derivative, uh, this kind of Hessian matrix around the log likelihood function, um, and uh, yeah. So this is a nice quantity. I'm going to come back to this in just a second, um, and then so up until this point, all of it is our generic statements about uh, estimators. Um, and then we considered a specific estimator, which is called the maximum likelihood estimator, which is like the most common thing that, that people do. Um, and, the, uh, and the idea there is if you have, um, 
um, you, if, you, if you have your statistical model and you plug in some data, some specific data, the maximum likelihood estimators, you just scan across theta and you find the value of theta that, that uh, maximizes the likelihood. Um, so the, uh, maybe it's, uh, um, at this point, it, it would maybe be useful to have some other, uh, some other examples. Um, so let me, uh, uh, let me save some. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'll get rid of all this stuff. Um, so if, if you, let's just consider a super duper simple example uh, where you have, uh, um, uh, where you have, um, what, what do I want to say? The, uh, if you had a, a, a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, so I'll, I'll write it, you know, is Gaussian of X given some mean and some standard deviation. If you had, if, and uh, I assume you all know the equation for distribution, and then I have a, a, a bunch of data that's uh, sampled according to this Gaussian, okay, and, uh, and, and then from that, I want to try to estimate, I could try to either estimate the parameter mu, the mean, or the standard deviation, right? And so if you do this, you could just, uh, uh, you could do the maximum likelihood trick, right, where I, I scan these parameters, but the other thing that I could do is I could just make up any function that I want, right? So um, uh, so for instance, here's an estimator, uh, x bar, which is just one over n of uh, i volt i equals one to n of x i, right? This is, this is some, uh, some function, right? I plug in a bunch of data, I calculate a mean, and I could, I could think of this as, uh, as mu hat, right? That was the mean. And so this didn't make any use of that model directly, right? I just wrote down some function. Um, and similarly, uh, for like the standard deviation, sigma squared, you could, uh, you, could, you could try to estimate the standard deviation some other way. So you know, this estimator also works independent. It doesn't need to be drawn from a Gaussian. It can be drawn from any distribution. And this I could write down as my, an estimate for the for the mean of that distribution, which might not even be a parameter of the model. Like the, the parameter of the model might not have a, a, a Greek letter associated that, that's the mean, right? You could have, imagine some kind of like a, like a e to the, you know, minus x over tau properly normalized um, if, this is, uh, if this is x. Um, you know, th there's, no, there's no parameter in this model that refers to the mean explicitly, but if I sample it many, many times, I can, you know, I can calculate the mean as well. But, um, but if, uh, <clears throat> if you actually, if you actually take this uh, equation and you try to find what the maximum likelihood uh, is, it turns out for the Gaussian case, this does also equal mu hat uh, MLE. So that will, if you do the calculus, it's not surprising, you're gonna get, this will also be the maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, when you talk about, uh, the, if you wanted to try to estimate the parameter sigma squared, um, and you do that for a Gaussian, um, the, uh, the maximum likelihood estimator is, uh, you, we could, you know, we could do the calculus, but I won't bother with, uh, you know, wasting your time on it, uh, is, uh, is x i minus, uh, x bar squared. Okay. So you have this one over n and you, and you, uh, you, you take each, you know, entry minus its mean, sum them all up, and uh, okay, you get this. So I think you've probably all seen this at some point in some classes. Do you know anything about, uh, do you remember anything kind of funny about this equation? Do you remember sometimes seeing n minus one in the bottom? So the thing about this is this maximum likelihood estimator, this is the maximum likelihood estimator for the quantity sigma squared, but if you, if you, uh, if you, if you go and you, you check uh, the bias of it, it turns out that this is a biased estimate. Okay, I don't think this, is really, this really matters, but just to illustrate the point, this is an example of an estimator that is biased. And so, um, so to try to fix that up, people do this other estimator, which is not, uh, so it's, you know, sigma squared hat, you know, uh, whatever, uh, you know, high school. Um, 
uh, th that's uh, that's equal to one over you know n minus one in the same sum, um, x i minus x bar squared. So this estimator is unbiased, but it was kind of fixed up by hand. Okay, and you could do it. It's like generally a lot of work to if you want uh, to come up with an unbiased estimator. Uh, and uh, but you can also see here that what's meant by uh, by the I had I erased the line the statement that the maximum likelihood estimator is asymptotically unbiased. If you have a lot of data, the difference between one over n and one over n minus one is is very small. So as n goes to infinity, these are going to be basically the same, and this will be unbiased again in the end. So, um, but it's a nice example of uh, you know I mean I always thought these were really boring. Uh, when I learned about them, uh, and that is in terms of like pedagogy of trying to get across these ideas, that's ac that's actually kind of a nice set of examples. Um, so the the other thing that's that's interesting, and I remember doing this in a in a course one time, is like I was live coding uh, the you know the some little Python examples to sample a bunch of data from a Gaussian, uh, calculate the mean and the, these two of the standard deviation and then compare them to the true value and show that one was biased and the other one wasn't. Uh, but they were, they both kept coming out biased and I was like in front of the classroom and I was like, what's, what's going on? And so what, I, what, what ended up happening was that I was not, uh, I was not plotting, uh, you know, I was making a plot, but instead of plotting sigma squared hat min uh, minus uh, sigma squared, so the, the estimated value minus the true value of sigma squared, where this should be zero if it's unbiased and hoping to see a distribution that looked like, like this with zero mean, I was seeing something that, uh, that was biased, but it's because I was, plotting, uh, I was plotting the square root <laughs> of this thing, you know, sigma hat squared. So I was plotting the standard deviation itself uh, minus, you know, sigma. So I was plotting that. So, and that's often what you see, right? Oftentimes you see with the the big square root, but uh, but that's that actually is biased. Um, and so th that is a kind of a nice intro into like the next thing that I wanted to talk about was about how uh, what happens to distributions and likelihood functions when you do changes of variables and things like that. So, um, so this one this one will actually you know the 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 mean will actually be away from zero if you if you uh, plot the uh, if you don't plot sigma squared, but you plot uh, this, you know, the square root of it. Um, so let me spend a little bit of time talking about that, and then uh, I, won't, I want to, uh, well, let's see, which order do I want to do it in? So that, I want to say that, and then I also have a, a nice example about this uh, that I think will hopefully kind of blow your mind a little bit. So, um, yeah, actually, I want to do the other example first before I get into this change of variables. But remember this, and we'll, and we'll get back to kind of understanding what's going on there. Um, okay. Is it, okay, so I'm going to erase all this stuff about the likelihood ratio. Um, but I do want you to kind of remember that, uh, that when we were talking about hypothesis testing, um, the, uh, the, in the frequentist context, the likelihood ratio was basically the opportunity hypothesis tests and also when we're talking about estimation you know the maximum likelihood is kind of our, our workhorse right so likelihood is like we just kind of keep hammering you over the head with the importance of the likelihood um, so in just a second we'll talk about transformation properties uh, but first I want to give you this example um, that has to do a, a, another kind of nice example about estimation. So imagine that uh, I'm in some like kind of high dimensional space, um, and uh, and I uh, here's some point that's going to be a mean of a, of a, of, a, of a simple variant Gaussian again. So you can imagine like a, a a little ball here. So this is you know these are the this is the x space. Uh, this is a, a mu vector. Um, and then, and then I'm sampling a, a bunch of xi's. So these are the uh, the xi's, and uh, my xi, you know, vectors are being sampled out of a of a multivariate normal that has a mean mu, and it also has some covariance, which for right now will just make it be uh, just be like the infinity matrix. So it's just like a perfect ball sitting there. Okay. Is this fine? So I have a little Gaussian blob and I'm sampling from it. 
Now, uh, let's say that I want to estimate uh, the mean of this this uh, distribution. So, what would like the the kind of what would you guess would be a good thing to do? Like, I would I would expect to do basically exactly the same thing, just per component, the normal the normal idea, right? So you have uh, you know x vector bar, right? Which is also uh, mu, uh, you know, mu vector hat uh, maximum likelihood estimate, you know, which is just the the typical one over n sum over i's of the of the x i vectors. Okay, so that center mass of this ball of points is what I would uh, expect. To, you know, that's my best guess of what the uh, the mean of this Gaussian distribution is. Um, so you can check it's unbiased. Um, it's uh, it, it you know achieves this kramer rao bound. It actually uh, for unbiased estimators it has the smallest possible variance. So it seems like it, and it's, it actually is an equal sign there. So you would think that this is the best possible estimator you can do, right? It's un, you know so uh, so it, it hits this limit, um, so which is good. But let's say that uh, what my goal is is. Uh, uh, you know, my goal is actually the mean squared error. I want my theta hat to be as close as possible to the true value. Seems seems reasonable. So this is something that's not biased. So the bias term is zero, and the and the, it has the smallest possible variance it can. So seems like we're done, right? So there's a, another estimator, and this was something that kind of. You know, shocked a lot of people, um, um, uh, which is called the uh, the James uh, Stein estimator, and uh, and uh, mu you know vector hat James Stein is equal to um, uh, one minus uh, n minus two over. Uh, the magnitude of uh, of uh, you know x vector bar you know this this one here um, doot, times uh, x vector bar. Okay, so what are you what is that doing? Um, so if if uh, it depends and, oh, and n is the you know the number of n is the number of dimensions of this vector. Um, I didn't I can just, I'll just say it instead of writing it. Um, so in if 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 we're in this drawing here, uh, we have you know n equals three. You know this in this case n equals three. <clears throat> so this number is is positive. This is this is positive. So one minus some you know positive number is less than one, right? And and x. So let's imagine that you know for this example that this is uh, that this is uh, x bar. Then uh, then you're going to go towards the origin, some amount. And get to uh, x uh, or you know whatever uh, mu James Stein, right? You know or you know mu hat. Okay. So so this is the it's clear that this is what it's doing, right? It's taking your unbiased you know uh, maximum likelihood estimator, the normal thing you would want to do, and moving it towards the origin some amount. Now the uh, is a so. I don't know. As a physicist, do you like this estimator? What are problem with estimators from the point of view of a physicist? It's got some, like, if you change dimension, the, the, the things are going to, well, let's see, is that true? Um, yeah, this actually, maybe not for units, but it has, it certainly has the issue that it depends on the origin, right? The origin seems like it should be totally irrelevant, right? Like if, if I if I sh shift, you know, from x to x plus delta, right? Then then the magnitude of this thing is going to change. So it's it's not translationally invariant, which is weird. Is there? Do I have a? Uh, Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I guess it's how you think about this term is a little funky, but the uh, but certainly like has all it it looks very wrong from a physics point of view, right? So the the uh, 
Um, the, the thing that really bothers me a lot is the, the idea that the, uh, that if you move the origin, like the way that you shift it is even going to change, right? Like if I put the origin over here, different direction, right? So, so it seems very, very strange, uh, but, uh, but what you can show is that the mean squared error of uh, mu hat James Stein, uh, you know, given whatever theta or something like that, uh, is, or sorry, mu, uh, is, is less than uh, the mean squared error for mu hat MLE uh, given mu. And, th and this is true for, for all the, <laughs> well, for all values of mu, I guess, except for zero, you know, other than, other than zero, um, you know, for almost all values of mu. Um, and uh, as long as uh, n is uh, bigger than or equal to, uh, or yeah, bigger, bigger or equal to three. So this is like a super weird estimator. And, uh, and so the, the, the thing that I'm trying to get at is that, uh, and you can just do it, I mean, you can, Monte Carlo program and plot the thing, and, and it definitely has a smaller mean squared error. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, isn't it that the mean squared error definition is not good, right? Um, so, so this it's a kind of funny uh, cart before the horse sort of statement, right? Like the. Uh, um, our intuition is that we don't want our, our estimators to be biased and we want them to be small, and that's kind of how we've been taught to think about things. But like, how can you not say that I want my estimator to be close to the true value? Like, like they're, both, they're both reasonable statements, right? My, my point is that the, uh, the, the, the kind of lesson to be learned from this thing is that, um, that in general, there's this trade-off between bias and variance. And if you want your estimator to be unbiased, uh, that's fine, and you can be the reason that you really that, and then you can try to have it make it have the smallest variance possible, which is what the means the, this one. Is. But if you allow yourself just a little bit of bias, you can dramatically reduce the variance and be closer to the true value. So, what do you actually want to do, right? So, this is this is a uh, this is kind of a you need to say what your notion of risk or loss or whatever is, right? So, um, um, and, and, uh, and so in what uh, Jules is going to be talking about in machine learning, this bias variance trade-off uh, happens in a lot of places. And so a lot of times you add, you come up with machine learning models that have more and more uh, flexibility, and sometimes th their variance can explode, but the but they will, and this also related to things like overfitting the data and stuff like that. So, Jill will talk about it more. This is it in the kind of classical statistical context, but it also comes up uh, in uh, machine learning. And there, your goal is often not something simple like I want the variance of my estimator to be small. It's like some other kind of more complicated task, right? Um, so, so the um, Fabio, I think. Uh, in front of you, I don't have an example, uh, but there's a, there's a one-page slide about statistical decision theory, and uh, <clears throat> maybe, can I see one to, yeah, thanks. Um, so the, uh, so uh, I'm not gonna write it all down because it takes too long, but um, the idea here is it's kind of a general framework for being able to think about a lot of these uh, kinds of problems. So you, you uh, <clears throat> the, the setup is that you have you have some statistical model like p of x given theta. Um, in, in this slide, it's written f of x given theta. Okay, but that's the statistical model. You you may or may not have a prior uh, on the on the model, so that's the it was written as pi of theta. Um, and then you imagine that you know you you're going to get some data, and then you need to do something, and uh, and so that <clears throat> that that very abstract notion of doing something is what's called a decision rule. It's a map. From, uh, from the given the data to some action space. And that action space could either be like playing a game, you know, like playing a game of uh, trying to predict uh, mu hat, right? So the, the, the delta function in that, this decision rule is mu hat. It's given the data, you're taking some action. Then you have to have a, a loss function and a risk. And so the, the loss function in that case would just be theta hat minus uh, theta. And then the, the risk would be the expectation of that, which is what in this example was, for instance, the mean squared error. 
Okay, so you but you get to say what your loss function is. So if you chose these other, like the bias or the variances, would be different loss functions, and they each have an expectation, which is which is called the risk. And so this is very much like what Jill was talking about with expected risk and the loss function and all these kinds of uh, things. But then the 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 other part that's kind of interesting is you see that when I write this, the mean squared error of my you know estimator given mu it's still a conditional statement. Like I have to specify what the true value is, right? So it's not just a number, it's like a function of whatever the true value is. So for instance, when mu was equal to zero, this thing is actually, you know, these two are the same. Right? But the, uh, um, so, um, yeah, so the, um, then the last little bit that I'll say that is then more carefully here is that, uh, So in general, you have this kind of this risk, which is written theta of delta, which is uh, uh, some expectation under your model. So I'll write it in the in the way that I've been writing it of whatever your loss function is that depends on the true value and your and your uh, your decision rule. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so this is the risk. Um, and the, the uh, point here is that, so you specify your decision rule, that's like your estimating strategy, and then you evaluate the risk, but it depends on the true value of the parameter. So now, uh, if you're trying to figure out like what, what strategy should I use, it's a little bit, it's a little bit non-obvious because you, uh, you don't, you know, the, the answer might depend on the true value of theta and you don't know the true value of theta. You see what I mean? So there, um, so there's, uh, so there's what's called the Bayes risk, um, where um, um, where you have uh, so if you have a prior on parameters, then what you can do is just uh, so I don't. I know what the risk is for every value of theta. If I also have a prior over theta, then I can uh, I can weight them appropriately, and then get the Bayes risk, which is the overall thing. So, for instance, if you're imagining delta is like, should I build the ILC or the LHC? Right. I'm mean, seriously. This is like the night. This is the framework to make to think about making big decisions for. Like Right, so uh, this is some decision I'm going to make, like which experiment I'm uh, going to build. This is what what theory of uh, beyond the standard model physics do you think is real? If you knew that it was uh, that there was you know nothing, and the only thing that we're going to see is like high you know high dimensional operators at some super high scale, you would build like EDM experiments, right? If you thought that you know if you if your parameter theta says that like uh, you have Susie just around the corner, you're going to want to build like you know the the high energy, you know, LHC or something like that, right? So, but you don't know what the true parameter is, so you come with prior over states of nature, like, you know, where you think the different, uh, uh, you know, different theories are, which is not based on anything other than, you know, what you think it is, and then, uh, and then you evaluate the risk of the different things, and then you have now a, a way of saying, given that prior, which, which experiment should I build, and then you optimize based on that, okay? So, um, so if you don't have that, so you want to be like uh, making decisions about which experiment you should build in the future, and you want to do it in a non-Bayesian way, you're really stuck at these kinds of statements. And you really can't, uh, you can't do much of, uh, of anything generally. Um, in, a, in some cases, you have a situation uh, where you have a decision rule, uh, delta star, uh, where, um, where uh, uh, you know, whatever, such that the risk of of, uh, of of theta comma delta star is less than or equal to the risk of theta comma delta some other decision rule uh, uh, for all values of theta, right? If you're in a situation like that, you're saying my decision rule is at least as good as this other decision rule, no matter what theta is. If you're in this like super special situation, then you don't necessarily need a prior because you know that this is always better, right? And in a situation like this, you say uh, delta star uh, dominates uh, delta, and then you say that uh, delta is, quote, 
uh, inadmissible uh, is an inadmissible decision. Like you would never use Delta, Delta Star is better, right? And this James Stein example was, was one of those. If you, what you cared about was mean squared error, the James Stein estimator is always better than, except for, or, you know, or equal to the, the, the maximum likelihood estimator. So it dominates. So you would want to use the James Stein estimator no matter what. Um, in other situations, that's not going to happen. There is going to be, you know, some regions of theta where one decision rules better and some regions of theta where the other decision rules better. And the only way you make up, be able to decide rationally which one to use is by putting a prior on theta. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is that I'm kind of a, generally an advocate of uh, like frequentist statistics when you're trying to like analyze data and report results in some way comes to making decisions about like what you're going to do, like that's where I kind of transition into being a Bayesian because you need to make a decision, you know, you can't just keep putting it off, you know, into the future and being agnostic and writing papers like this is my likelihood function. Like when you actually have to decide what experiment you're going to build, you need to do something. But at that point, I'm like comfortable with it being my subjective degree of belief because it's you know my money or something like that, right? It's my future. So uh, so at this point, you know it, this doesn't really need. To, this can be your own subjective prior because it's your your decision, or it's like our collective prior as a community because we're collectively building you know this uh, deciding what to do in the future. So this this framework is kind of the nice thing to do. Um, you can also kind of read the whole thing backwards, which is that if I don't. If I don't know my prior and I'm, and I'm choosing a particular decision rule, so I've chosen a particular delta, um, then you can kind of read the whole thing backwards and say, what prior uh, does that correspond to? Like, for what prior is this a, an optimal decision rule? Um, and you can try to kind of work the whole thing backwards, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a strange thing to do because one is that sort of assuming that you're making optimal decisions. So like uh, in terms of uh, Nyman Pearson, like I erased the, the hypothesis testing, the, the delta is basically a decision rule. You're going to either claim a discovery or not claim a discovery, right? And, and, the, uh, and the notion of uh, the loss, you, uh, if you claim a discovery and it's not actually there, that's like the type one, type two error is, is, the, is the loss. Uh, sorry, the loss is, you know, some number if you claim it as that's false, and, uh, and then the expected value of that is then, you know, your p-value, like it's how often you're, you're doing this, uh, making type 1 errors. And the, uh, and so, uh, so you can think about, like, the Nyman-Pearson testing in this language, um, and then you can, and so you have some sort of risk associated to it, um, but you can, uh, you can also think of it of, like, okay, I want to have a five sigma discovery criteria that somehow implicitly is saying, like, I don't think that the other, you know, I think the standard model is probably right and new physics is probably unlikely, right? Something is kind of what we have in the back of our mind. So you can try to use the argument to kind of back calculate the problem that if you assume that we're kind of being optimal. So anyways, the, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of set of ideas to try to through. There's one of the, uh, this is kind of, uh, 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 there, there's some highlighted ones. The second to last point here is, it talks about, uh, uh, it says, under mild conditions, uh, every admissible uh, decision rule, so this like data star, delta star is admissible. Um, every admissible uh, is a, whatever, a generalized Bayes rule with, to some prior. Basically what that's saying is that, uh, that you can find some prior where whatever decision that you're making is like the right one. And uh, people often, I think, abuse this statement to try to say that uh, this is kind of proof that Bayes is like the, the Bayesian approach is like always the right way. But the problem is that this might not be your prior. Doesn't mean that, uh, that your prior is the one that's going to be optimal. So like if you put, um, well, okay, that's gonna, I'm gonna get too in the weeds there, but uh, I would like read this uh, and think on it uh, in a quiet room for some time because it's like I think there's a lot of profound stuff on that slide, but it takes a takes some time to uh, digest. Okay, um, <clears throat> does anyone want to ask any questions here? No. Okay. All right. So um, okay. 
So then, um, okay, so now I'm going to get a little bit more uh, concrete uh, and talk about, um, go back a little bit to the, these issues about uh, transformational properties and kind of what I was getting at here. So, um, so let's imagine that here's X and, uh, uh, well, I'm going to think about, okay, I'll, I'll think about a very simple situation. Um, let's say that we have a, a, a spinner and you, you flick the spinner and it spins around a, a lot. And uh, so this is, and we're going to measure this angle, uh, but I'll call it X. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so if you, if you flick the spinner and it spins around a lot of times, uh, then what would you expect the distribution of X to look like? Uniform between zero and two pi, right? Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Um, and so this is P of X and P of X equals, what is it? One over two pi. Exactly. Cause it has to be normalized. Okay, great. Now, uh, let's, uh, what we want to do and is consider how this distribution changes, uh, when I change variables. Okay. So let's imagine that instead I want to make a plot of, uh, uh, I'll call it, you know, y, which is, uh, say, cosine x. So cosine x goes between minus 1 and 1. So then the question is, what does the distribution of cosine x look like? Like, it's a totally random angle, right? So is, it, so is cosine x also uniform? cosine x is going to be preferred over other values? Okay, so, so the, it, you know, the, I don't know what your thoughts are on saying anything. Do you think it's uniform? You feel it's a trap? <laughs> so, um, right, so, zero would be, be preferred? Maybe, yeah. What what's the maybe yeah right yeah so the thing that's nice here this is you know if in, in another when I have a computer up and I I what's nice is this is like such an easy thing to just do and and uh, and uh, like in Python you just say like you know give me you know like a million numbers between zero, uniform between zero and two pi, you make a histogram, it's flat, and then you just make a histogram of cosine of those numbers, and you get something. Uh, so what you get is something that looks like, uh, like this. Okay, and so what's going on? Well, let's first, let's think about, uh, you know, x versus y, right? Um, or I should have drawn, you know, here's y, sorry, here's x. So cosine starts at one, you know, whoo, whoo. okay. Um, so th there's lots of different ways of thinking about it, but one way of thinking about it is that you can make kind of equal spaced ticks along the way. And then for each of them, imagine evaluating cosine X and then see what happens, right? And so, you know, you can start to see that happens is that they all kind of bunch up here and they bunch up here and they get stretched out there, right? So what you're doing is there's a, because the slope here is, is steep, you're kind of stretching out the variable. And, uh, and if you, and uh, over here, the, the slope is very small. So you get a bunch of things that get mapped into basically the same value of, of cosine X, right? And this is actually not that different than, for instance, if you've ever seen these pictures of like a, a nebula or something in space, it's like just some cloud of gas, but you're like looking through, like you, when you look through the middle, it looks fairly transparent, but when you look along the edges, you, you have, you're like going through a lot of dust and you get these things that look like rings, but it's not that there's a ring that just happens to be oriented towards the earth, it's like hell, but you pick up these kinds of effects. So this is also related to things like cost, you know, relevant for dark matter and stuff like that, but, um, you can also imagine the simplest thing that what if, uh, you know, this is a different relationship, but if here's x 
and uh, and if y equaled like 10x, right? You know, you're going to have a a slope like this, right? And you're going to go from 0 to 2 pi to 0 to 10 pi, and so you know that it's got to uh, the that if you just stretch this out, the the density has to go down, right? So if the slope is big, it's going to make the density go down. If the slope is small, the density is going to go up. Um, and this is just the nonlinear version of that. Okay, so that's like roughly that's the reason it looks like it does. But it'd be nice to like have a, a rule to figure out like exactly what the formula looks like, right? So, so how are you going to to do that? Um, well, I should I'll draw this again really quick. Um, so if I think about uh, uh, some region like uh, here and here, and I'll call that uh, x a and x b, it has some probability, right? Um, so here's uh, x a and x b, and then that's going to turn into uh, y a and and y b, which is sits uh, over here somewhere, you know. There we go, uh, y a and y b, um, and there's some probability. Yes. Okay. So, um, so what do I know about the probability here and the probability there? Right. But I mean, more simply, if x falls between x a and x b, if it falls in here, then is it does it fall between y a and y b? Yes, right. So, like those probabilities have to be the, the same, right? So, so I know that the that the integral from x a to x b of uh, if I call it uh, you know p of of x uh, dx has to equal uh, the integral from y a to y b of of uh, I need a new name for this one, so I'm just gonna I'll call it g of y instead of and I'll call this one, this is P of X is a G of Y, and, but I don't know what G of Y equals. That's what I'm trying to figure out. But whatever it is, uh, G of Y dy, right? So I know that this probability needs to be the same, right? Okay, and so what, th this is kind of a silly point, but like this equal sign is, comes from, you know, the fact that I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking at what's going on and I'm like making the assertion that these two things should be equal because it's, it's clear. There's another kind of equal sign that I can do, which is just straight up calculus which I don't need to know, I don't need to have this picture, I can just look at this and say what happens if I do a change of variables. So I'm going to rewrite this integral in terms of x. Okay, so if I rewrite that integral in terms of x, integral of g of uh, uh, y as a function of x. Right, so I'm going to think of, you know, y as a function of x, and then I'm going to want to integrate it by dx, but to do that, I'll, I'll you know, sort of multiply and divide by dx, right? So I'm going to be integrating dx. I've changed variables. I'm thinking this thing is a function of x. And now I need to change my lim limits of integration uh, to be in terms of x again. But well, that's easy because I just go back to the x's, right? So I know that it's uh, from xa to xb. Does that make sense? So I this, this is rewriting this integral but I know that it has to be equal to this because of the picture. But now, look at this, I have an integral from xa to xb dx, so this whole thing has to be equal to this, right? Okay, so there we go, that's it. So I have p of x has to be equal to g of y, you know, of x uh, times dy dx. Okay, so this is the kind of the transformation rule. Uh, uh, that's going to allow me to go uh, back and forth. The thing that's going to be a little bit annoying is that, at least in the way that, uh, if I, if, so th this is fine, um, but this is kind of useful in the wrong direction, right? If, if I knew P of X and I knew my function uh, that this was Y, uh, you know, Y of X is equal to cosine X, and then I want to actually then I can take the derivative of this, but I'm going to have something that's a function of x, right? And uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, g of cosine of x. So this is all being written out in terms of x. What I'd really like to do is like write it in terms of y. So you 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 can you can solve it, but you basically you just need to do the opposite version of it. Is think of uh, x as a function of y, and and uh, you you know you can take the derivative 
derivative that's just the inverse of this thing, and you can solve the whole thing in terms of y, and I'll just leave that as a kind of uh, as a, uh, an exercise. It's not very hard to then write what this formula is. What is what is g of y? Um, I can help you if you want, but it's not. It's just a little bit of trigonometry, so this is a worthwhile exercise to do. Is what is g of y in terms of y? Okay, I mean you can you can certainly do dy dx. You just get you know your uh, minus sine x and all these. But you know there's an absolute value here and things. But um, okay, so um, so there, there's there are two other things about this uh, story that are kind of worth pointing out. Uh, one of them is that there's two different values of x that that work, right? So when you actually do this, you have to be careful with the factor, you know, factors of two. You need to basically break it into two parts and realize that for every value of y, that there's two values of x's that map into it. Um, but the reason that I'm mentioning this is not to uh, is that this more generally comes up when uh, we start talking about uh, like neural network type approaches to to make uh, uh, to try to uh, model densities. So there are these, uh, Jules showed this picture of the faces and things like that. And that picture of the faces, it's done through a change of variables. Um, you have, at the beginning, you have basically some uniform random variables or Gaussian random variables, and you run them through a neural network, which is a very complicated change of variables that's going kind of from you know, x to y. And then the, the output uh, is in the shape of images. So this distribution over random variables turns into a distribution over images, and you look at them. But the problem is that there are several different uh, there are several different um, you know points in the space that might map to the same image, and because of that, um, it, it's difficult to know what the density is, what the probability density for that particular image is, because you would have to find all the different places that map to the same image. In this case, it's really easy, because it's cosine x, you can just look at it and you know which two values. But if it was generally some weirdo function, you would have to kind of search through the whole space and find which ones map to the same, to the same spot. And that's going to be like totally intractable in, a, in, a, in general. So that, because of that, these generative adversarial networks, they're useful for generating images, and they use this change of variables formula, uh, but they still lead to this intractable density. You can use them to, to generate a bunch of images, but if you give me an image, I can't tell you what, what uh, the, that probability is, um, which is kind of, a, kind of annoying for these uh, generative adversarial networks. If you wanted to be able to do that, what you need is the mapping between x and y uh, to be what's called a, a bijection. So you need there to be like a one-to-one -one mapping between different values of x and different values of y. So if I, for instance, cut off this side, um, then it would work out fine. Um, and, uh, and so it turns out, though, that what's nice is you can uh, build neural networks where, um, where y is a, you know, where you can think of, uh, 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 th this uh, this this uh, function, you know, uh, well, how do I want to write it? Uh, if I think of it as you know, that goes from x uh, to y, uh, that's that's also a bijection, meaning that for some value of y, there's a unique value of x, and if you in that situation then uh, you can use this change of variables formula um, and, uh, and, you, and so uh, to come up with a density. And so then that's actually what, what ends up happening is that uh, you can use a very simple density like a, a uniform or, a, or a, a, a Gaussian distribution or something like that. That's called a, a distribution. And then you use a very complicated neural network to change variables in some very complicated way, but you have to construct the neural network restricted in a certain way so that it's still a bijection, so that it has a unique inverse. And then if you do that, then you, then you can uh, know what the, the density of the output of the neural network is um, uh, by just uh, taking its derivative. And the way that you know, all of this machine learning stuff works is that you can make derivatives efficient. So there are these uh, approaches to try to model distributions that use neural networks uh, that have this bijective property. And those are often referred to as uh, normalizing flows, or just flows in general. 
um, because you're kind of flowing the probability from X to Y. And that, uh, and those are also like very, um, they're pretty impressive. So we started trying to use them for, for instance, trying to model uh, these, uh, uh, you know, like uh, particle physics uh, data distributions and things like that, where you don't necessarily know what the what the uh, distribution looks like. And so the um, okay, so, um, okay. Um, oh, I just erased the thing that I was looking for. But uh, in terms of the uh, um, so, if you make one of these neural network distributions, then the the function, you know, the this function has a bunch of you know weights and biases and things like that, like you see in what Jules was talking about, and so you those end up becoming the parameters of the model. So these these basically are the are the theta for this this uh, the so the the parameters of the neural network become the parameters of the model, and you end up flowing. Uh, you know, some simple distribution like a uniform distribution, but now in high dimensions to some complicated output, and then you try to optimize it just by doing this kind of maximum likelihood based approach. Um, okay. All right. Now, um, so so this was the whole thing about the change of variables. Uh, so the the point here is that when you when you change uh, the observable, the random variable x to some other variable y, you have this Jacobi factor. Uh, that you have to uh, that you have to take uh, into account. Um, but what about when you talk about the likelihood uh, when you have p of x given theta, and I change to uh, uh, p of x uh, given you know phi of theta? So if I think about if I reparameterize the the model, okay, um, how does the likelihood function transform? Okay, so this would be. For instance, if I think about just to be, if I think about a Gaussian that has a, a mean and a standard deviation, um, I could think of it as a Gaussian, you know, of x with a mean and a standard deviation squared, right? I'm still referring to the same model, right? I'm just using a different, a different parameter. You know, this is kind of like this is playing the role of phi, and you know, this is playing uh, the role of you know theta, say. Right. So, um, if I have some particular data, so imagine you know, like a really specific number, you know. Um, so I'll, I'll draw one to make it really concrete. You know, here's x. It has some mean. It has some sigma. I have a, a particular value x naught. Um, there's there's this density right here. This is that's that's what I'm talking about. This is g of x naught, the height of this curve right here, that's g of x naught given mu and, uh, you know, and, and sigma. If I talk about the same model in terms of sigma squared, d does this change at all? Does the height of this curve change? No, right? But if I think about the likelihood function, um, like if I, uh, if I wanted to, uh, okay, well, sigma is kind of a weird, uh, weird example. The same thing as I could imagine it in terms of, you know, I could reparameterize mu or something. But if I if I think about uh, theta and I have some some likelihood function, and then I go to uh, phi of theta, um, uh, like let's say that uh, let me just pick a couple different values. Like this is uh, theta one, and this is theta two, and this is you know uh, phi of theta one. And over here is uh, phi of uh, theta two, right? Um, bad, bad example. Uh, sh should have chosen uh, theta one over here or something, and theta two there. I need to choose more different values. Sorry. I'm just. This is just a generic one. It's not for this particular plot. I just mean whatever the likelihood function happens to look like. Say it looks like this. You know, uh, if I change variables, it could be some w wiggly thing. But I know that that this value is going to be here, and this value is going to be here. And you know, it could do any kind of crazy thing in the in the middle. You know, like I can stretch and squeeze. You know, if I change the value of theta. I'm changing this axis in some kind of weird way, but the actual value of the likelihood function is not changing at all, right? So the my point is that that uh, the shape of the likelihood function you can, when you when you parameterize the model, is going to do something weird, but the actual value of the likelihood is totally invariant. Okay, so 
So in this situation, you, when you talk about changing the observables, you say that the density, the probability density, is covariant with changing a change of variables on the observables because of this Jacobian factor. Uh, the likelihood function is invariant to uh, reparameterizing the, the parameters. Okay, the actual value of the likelihood is invariant. Um, now, because of that, the one thing that's interesting is you would you might think about like a like if you talk about the mean of a distribution, like the mean of a distribution, if you change the variables, the mean is going to move around, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a totally different variable. If you think about the the mode, the most probable value, you might think that that would, that would be you might think that would be invariant, but that also totally changes. Like this distribution doesn't even have a most probable value, right? But I can I can make the the probability density go, go up or down however I want by changing the variables, uh, by squishing and squashing, because I can make this Jacobian be anything that I want. Um, so, so the uh, so that like the density and the, the the most probable value, all these things are are not invariant states. Okay. Um, but the likelihood value is invariant um, uh, to reparameterizing the parameters. But the actual likelihood value, if I if I go to you know from x to y, is going to change. Um, but then let's think about uh, one other thing, which is that uh, let's think about a likelihood ratio. So if I have P of X given theta um, over, you know, uh, theta prime or something like that, and I change uh, the variable X, I'm, and I think of it as, you know, uh, uh, um, I want to go to, uh, you know, P of Y. Uh, given theta times p of y given theta prime, uh, then I'm going to have some Jacobian factor, but it's the same Jacobian factor for both of them, right? So, so these will cancel. So a likelihood ratio is invariant under changing uh, from x to y. Okay, so that's a that's a nice uh, that's a nice statement. So this thing is invariant. Um, um, to uh, you know theta to phi, sorry. Um, so is this one, but this is also invariant uh, uh, to uh, from for x to y. Right? Okay. So um, now the 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 other thing that's kind of worth thinking about is what if I think about a posterior distribution, uh, a posterior distribution of theta given x. Okay. And I change uh, from theta uh, to phi. What happens to, to to the distribution? So here's you know here's theta, and over here is phi. Um, and let's evaluate, imagine that the, you know here's like my my theta one value, um, and here is uh, phi of theta one. Is it going to have the same posterior value? You see what I'm trying? I just want to think about this. Is I'm thinking about Bayes' theorem now. So I had remember uh, through Bayes' theorem, I have you know pi of theta given x looks like the the likelihood p of x given theta up some prior on theta, and then there's like a, a normalization constant essentially, which is you know p of x. So here's Bayes' theorem again, just to remind you. The question is, so the, when I change, when I think about a particular value of x and I go from theta to phi, the likelihood is invariant, right? So meaning that, like I had these the curves before, the the log likelihood was uh, I'm just drawing a log likelihood curve, but the the uh, you know if I have a particular data set x. And I think about uh, the likelihood at theta, and I change to some other parameterization of the model. The the likelihood is invariant, okay. But if I what about posteriors? If I change from theta to phi, what happens to the posterior? What's that? It is it or is not? It's not. Yeah, because this is distribution. Like you can kind of forget about the given x. Right, it's a it's a probability distribution on theta, and this is a probability distribution on phi, and the way that they transform is just like what we did over here, right? So there's a Jacobian that that uh, uh, that has to happen here, 
And um, so if you look, if you trace it to, to this version, what happens? This piece is invariant. When I go from theta to phi, the likelihood is invariant, but the prior has to evolve with this Jacobian factor. So, um, okay, so it's kind of a sort of simple statement, but the other thing is that a lot of times people think, oh, well, it isn't a Bayesian posterior basically just the likelihood with uh, sticking a one here for the prior, like a uniform prior? And like numerically, it looks right. You know, if you just put, if I just say that my prior is uniform and just kind of put, I'm lazy and I just put a one here, um, then the posterior looks like the prior numerically, right? Uh, but if I change from theta to phi, then my, if it was a, a, a uniform prior on theta, it's now not a uniform prior on phi. Um, cause, uh, it, because it needs to, you know, covariantly transform along with that change of variables. So if the idea is that I want to always be able to just put a uniform prior on whatever variable I'm working on, that is like not, uh, that doesn't make sense. That, that procedure doesn't work. So this idea that you can, that Bayesian, you know, that, that frequentist statistics is Bayesian statistics with a, just a flat prior is like not a true statement. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now the, the last thing, part of the reason I wanted to go into this is because I also wanted to talk about uh, this guy up here, um, this Fisher information metri matrix, because you can now think about some properties of what's going on uh, with this thing. And, um, and what's, what you can end up showing is that uh, this, this Fisher information matrix um, is uh, uh, when you change um, from theta to phi, the the, uh, the the actual value of the likelihood is not going to change, but these derivatives will change. So this uh, so this thing is uh, is covariant um, uh, to reparameterization of you know theta to phi, um, and then because its derivatives are looking at differences of likelihoods. Uh, um, sorry, and the, of log likelihoods and differences of log likelihoods are like likelihood ratios, uh, then it's going to be invariant to ch uh, uh, invariant um, to uh, f uh, of changes from x to y. Th these two, yeah, these are the same values of theta. Is it, that's what you're saying? Yeah. Um, uh, but, well, it's, this is the theta that's used to generate the data, but then you, you when, you're taking the, when you're taking the derivative, if you want, uh, I mean, you still need to think of this as a, as a function of theta so you can take the derivatives. Yeah, so, okay, so it's a sort of, maybe I could write something like this. So it's a, all this evaluated at theta naught, you know, and this is kind of like theta naught. You, you need to think of this, sorry, yeah, I should erase this. Uh, you need to think of this as a free parameter so you can take the derivatives, but then you evaluate the derivative at some value, which is the same as this one. Um, so the thing that's interesting about this is that it has, uh, it's also some, you know, symmetric. Um, so this is, has all the properties that you, of a, of a metric tensor. So this is like general relativity. Uh, you know, this is the metric tensor. Uh, and the, and you're parameterizing the, the, you know, instead of like space time, you're parameterizing a statistical model in terms of theta. So as you move around theta space, you know, the metric tensor can evolve and change and there's a connection and there's all the differential geometry that you would want. Um, and then, so there's a whole topic about the differential geometry of statistical manifolds and that's called information geometry. Um, and it's a really like pretty beautiful theory. The other thing that's interesting is if I have, some extra data, like, you know, like say this is, say my model looks like, uh, you know, I have P of X given theta, and then I also have P of uh, Y given theta, some other, well, I'm not, or sorry, I'll call it X1 and X2. This is some more data, and I keep adding, you know, I, I keep collecting, doing more experiments and collecting more data, um, then the statistical model, if it's a product, then the log likelihoods just add, right? And so you, this thing is additive over more data. So, uh, so if you have the, uh, if you know the Fisher information metric for like doing the LHC experiments and then you have it for like some future experiment, you could add the metric tensor component by component and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and see what happens. And then you can relate that to how well you can make measurements. So that for instance, one experiment might constrain one direction in parameter space 
example, but leave another direction basically unconstrained, and another one will will fit that. Uh, and so you can you can analyze stuff instead of doing like arduous experimental, you know, searches and limit setting procedures and things. You can basically just characterize this information matrix and then combine them. And so there's like a this is kind of like how I think phenomenology should be done basically is that you know you you provide this thing uh, and then uh, and you basically study the phenomenology in terms of the uh, information geometry um, so um, the other thing that's kind of so somewhat interesting to say about this and it's maybe that is that when I think about like a theory like supersymmetry or something like that I have no idea how to parameterize that theory I mean we, you know you you parameterize it in terms of some masses of but do you do it at high scale parameters or low scale parameters do you do the logs of the masses do you do beta or tangent beta the Higgs mass or the log of the Higgs mass or you know I mean, you have all these choices right so those are all parameter changing from theta to phi and uh, and so what's interesting is that the 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 uh, if you think about what the contours look like and say in the theta space and you want to translate it to the phi space that those contours should move should change and and the way that the geometry changes is exactly the right has the right you know covariant transformation properties that you would want so if you apply some procedure in the theta space and translate it to the phi space it's going to be the same as applying the procedure phi you do uh, so you'll get the same results that way so um, yeah anyway so it's a nice uh, it's a nice story because of that, uh, because it has the kind of right transformation properties and matches kind of like how you would want priors to transform also. Uh, there was a physicist and statistician named Harold Jeffries that, that proposed that, uh, that if you wanted to come up with a prior on your parameters that was kind of uh, objective and not like a subjective notion of, of prior probability that you could use this kind of information geometry idea to have a kind of objective way of putting a measure which is essentially uniform in the natural coordinates of, of the information geometry. Um, and so the, uh, so, I don't know, I just want to kind of throw that stuff out there because it seems, uh, it, it seems very natural for, you know, for physics. Um, and also just this idea that like, uh, I'll just say a little bit more, is that if you think about like, a, what is this kind of telling you a little bit, is that if you, if you imagine some uh, region of your parameter space where as you move around, uh, the, the predictions change very slowly, and the, the theory is super boring there, and the, the observable consequences in your experiment are very small, then the, log like, then the likelihood is going to be very flat, right? And these derivatives are going to be small, and, like, uh, and, and what it's going to say is that the distance between these two parameter points is small, right? So you might as well kind of shrink them together in the natural coordinates and think of them as like all close by because the, the phenomenology is very similar. But if you get to some point where, for instance, like the, the mass hierarchy of two particles changes or something in the decay change or you get into some squeeze scenario or something and all of a sudden the kinematics start changing rapidly and the decay patterns change, there is like you see the phenomenology change very, very rapidly, right? And when that happens, uh, then these derivatives are all going to be big. And what you're saying is that these points, even though they look close by in parameter space, you really want to like stretch them all out. And that's where all the interesting stuff is happening, right? So this is like really, I don't know, it's a very satisfying kind of uh, picture of, of, uh, of what's going on. So, okay. Um, I don't know. So should, uh, what should we do? We want we do like a break or something or it goes until when to 45? Um, I don't know. Should we take a short break or no? No? Keep going? Okay, great. Um, all right. Okay, so I'm just... Okay, sure. Okay, great. So, um, fine. Uh, is there... I'm going to erase some stuff. I'm kind of at a natural transition point. Are there th any questions or things that that people would like to hear? Uh, any requests? <laughs> Otherwise, I. Um, okay, so the, then, then I guess what I'll do. What I'll do next, then I think, then is uh, is talk about um, um, talk a little bit about uh, how we go f uh, from uh, hypothesis testing ideas to trying to make like. Uh, limits on parameters and then uh, and then we can start to 
you know, then get into things that have to do with, for instance, when you have uncertainties and stuff like that. Um, okay. Um, Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, so let's imagine that we have some uh, some parameter space of our of a of a of a theory. Okay. So this could think of it as whatever your your favorite theory is. So it could be like standard model measurements or SUSY searches or you know lambda CDM cosmology or something like that. Um, now, when you when you collect, uh, you're going to collect some data. And, and then in the end, you would like to say, for instance, uh, what regions of the parameter space are consistent with this data, right? And then try to exclude regions of the parameter space that are not consistent with the data. So you see, you know, plots that might look either like, a, you know, nice little ellipses or they might look like kind of weirder, you know, weirder regions uh, like that. Or, you know, this is also, for instance, in like dark matter searches, you see these kinds of plots, you know, all the time, exclusion regions or, um, so this is a place where slides are useful, but uh, hopefully good enough, okay? Um, and oftentimes you see things like this up in the, the top, you know, 95% confidence level or something like that. Um, and uh, so, so first thing I want to do is think about like what is, so uh, first is what, what is the uh, meaning of, of these plots? Like what's the interpretation of this contour? Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that one? Well, this this one might be the like the sixty eight percent or something, uh, and then the night. But let's focus. You know, pick one. It doesn't really the, the number is not the the issue. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so if we pick one of them, uh, there's this idea that you know the probability that uh, theta is inside of the blob, you know, and the blob uh, is equal to, you know, whatever, 95% or something like that. Is that, that fine? Okay, so that's certainly a, uh, a reasonable thing. Of course, this is like, a, this is a plot that you don't make beforehand, you make it after you've collected some data, right? So, um, you know, so we can say, you know, uh, given the data, uh, is equal to uh, you know whatever some number ninety five percent. Okay, great. So, so what can you tell from the way that this like this is a probability of theory given data statement, right? So like before, this doing it this this way of saying it would be a, a, a what's called a Bayesian uh, credible and credible interval. Uh, and, and people try to use this term credible when they're trying to be specific that it's the, it's the Bayesian procedure, okay? Now, um, so, then, so there's a few things. One is that remember, you could write out Bayes' theorem. The only, the only way you're gonna be able to make this statement is if you have a prior on the parameters. Okay, so if you came with a prior, you could do this. You could do this procedure, and I can talk a little bit about how how that works. Um, but you know, and then if you want, you know, this this thing is you're basically integrating uh, inside of that region. You know, inside of this region, uh, p of theta given uh, data. You know, d theta, um, and that, and then you just stick Bayes' theorem in here, and and you. Uh, you know, the, so that, that's what this, that's what this means, right? Okay. So, um, so then it just becomes like numerically, how do you do this integral? Um, okay. And then <clears throat> the other thing is that there's lots of different regions that would have the same probability, right? If this is 95%, I could shift the whole thing. It's not unique, right? There's the, there's an infinite family of different ways to draw that contour. So then you need some way of like, how am I going to do it? So usually, if you imagine coming out of the board, this posterior distribution, you would do some kind of level set or something like that to try to make it as small as possible. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, great. So the, 
um, if you're if you what, what do I want to say? Let, let's imagine that uh, we got you know the data fluctuated in some way, uh, which was unlikely, and so the data was kind of usual. Um, then uh, then or, or let me say it a different way. If we did the experiment again. Um, is the is the contour going to look exactly the same, or is it going to change? If we get if we get new data, right, the likelihood is going to change, the posterior is going to change, everything's going to change, and and it's going to move around, right? So the, the 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 point I'm getting at is that this contour is a random thing. You know, it's sort of like we had an estimator that depended on the data, that was like a point in parameter space. This is now a whole like contour. And that contour is a random object. And so you could imagine that you get some very kind of unusual data and this contour has fluctuated a lot. And so is it impossible for like uh, this, this could, um, I mean, in my mind, like there could be some true value. If there's a, some true value of the, you know, of the parameter theta, if there were some true value of the parameter theta, that ha then certainly get some data uh, that, that uh, the fluctuated that the contour is over here and doesn't cover that true value of theta. In, in which case, it's not necessarily a, a problem here because you're just saying that the, you know, the chance is that, you know, you're thinking there's a 95% chance that that's happening. But, but I guess what I'm, I, what I'm getting at is that uh, um, th there's also a notion in the kind of frequentist way w when you want to ask what in the frequentist way, if you think that the, there's one true value of this parameter, uh, in this situation, what's the probability that theta true is inside the contour? I mean, in this example, it's zero, right? It's not in the contour, and, or it is in the contour, right? So in the frequentist way of thinking where you think that there is like a particular value that's the true one, uh, this doesn't, this, it's either zero or one, right? Um, and in the Bayesian way, it's not that there, there is no theta true, there's a, a probability distribution over where you think the parameter is and then you calculate the posterior and you do that integral and that all makes sense okay but if you if you have in the back of your mind that there's a particular value of the parameter that's true then this sentence this this, this whole statement just doesn't make any sense at all because the prior basically doesn't exist or it's just like a you know it's, does that make sense so in the in the so if we if we write it again as you know p of of uh, of uh, you know, data uh, given theta. This would be like the frequentist likelihood thing that you know how to make a prediction. So you can stick any value of theta in there. Um, and then you have uh, the prior on theta. If you think that there's one particular value of theta that's true, then then uh, either you, you pick it ahead of time and you put your prior probability all on that spot, but then there's no point doing the experiment. Or this object just does not exist. Like it just... Uh, um, and, and I meant to spend a little bit more time talking about these kinds of, you know, how is it that in the Bayesian frequentist way that you can have such a fundamental breakdown? Like, uh, it seems like statistics is fairly mathematical. So, like, how is it that you can have this, you know, these two different ways of approaching what's going on? So the, the issue there, like, if you do uh, uh, the axiomatic, uh, cool, uh, Rob's, uh in the kind of axiomatic way of dealing with uh, statistics. When you talk about probability, you need to define, you, you, you have a few axioms that you need to satisfy, which I had like, I wrote down at one point without naming them. But, uh, well, whatever, the, you, you, you know, when I was, uh, you basically have that, there's a formal way of talking about it, but if you think about like events or things that can happen, and the probability that you assign to those events needs to be bigger than or equal to zero, um, if you have, uh, if you have like event one uh, as, uh, as sort of disjoint from event two, so this would be like, you know, when I was drawing these kinds of things, you know, you know, when I was drawing this kind of stuff, um, there's the idea like if here's another event over here, like a circle, like this circle is disjoint from the triangle. Um, so if you're in a situation, then uh, P of uh, E1 uh, plus, uh, sorry, P of E1 uh, and uh, E2 should equal to P of uh, uh, E1 plus the probability of event two. So that very kind of obvious statement. So if 
These two overlap, so you wouldn't use that rule there, but these two don't overlap, so the probability of the circle and the probability of this triangle, you can just add the probabilities, and then the, and then the probability associated to uh, the kind of uh, the union of, uh, sorry, the union of all the EIs, you know, that, get, get, that gives you, like, the whole possibilities, that thing needs to be one. So he's like very simple, intuitive axioms. But then you can try to come up with what things satisfy these axioms. And anything that satisfies these axioms, the rest of statistics like mathematically follows. Um, and so in the case, uh, so there's there two leading ways of, uh, of thinking of, of things that satisfy these axioms. One of them is a notion of like a, a subjective degree of belief that you're going to assign to things. If you want to do that, you need your like your belief system to be coherent, so people can't kind of find some inconsistencies in how you assign probabilities to things. But if you have a coherent, consistent way of assigning probabilities that satisfy these axioms, uh, then you know then that's a good notion of probability, and you can do you can use Bayesian statistics if your if your way of assigning probabilities to the parameter space is coherent. Uh, but the other way of Probabilities that's common is the is the is the uh, so so that the one that I just described would be, you know, uh, uh, the subjective, you know, uh, uh, you know, degree of belief, and you can try to quantify this by, for instance, setting up uh, games and things like this. You can try to say like what bets would you take and look at the odds ratios that you would do and you could try to do that in some systematic way to assign to actually make these like be n numerical values. Um, the, the other thing that you can do is think about the uh, long uh, term uh, frequencies. So for instance when I say what's the chance of rolling a one I can take a dice you know and take a die and roll it you know a thousand times and see how often I get a one, and that limit of frequencies is the definition of probability. Um, and uh, and so in the kind of classical quantum mechanics setup where you think about like the probability, like you know a Stern-Gerlach device or something where I have like you know a beam go through a splitter and I ask like if it's you know in the plus x state, what's the probability that it comes out as plus z? You know, you can just imagine you have a beam with a whole bunch of electrons that are prepared in the plus x state. You try it a whole bunch of times, and you just count how often they come up in the plus z state. You know, and uh, and that's your definition of that's your operational definition of probability, and that's the thing that we're we mean when we compute it in quantum mechanics. So this is like a very natural from a quantum mechanics point of view. Um, but in that situation, you know, all of the things that we've talked about in terms of uh, like uh, LHC physics, things like this, this, uh, this, this works. Um, uh, but when we want to talk about the prior probability, some theory parameter, how we we can't we can't use this notion of probability if we only have kind of one universe with one specific value of the true uh, parameter. So if your picture of the universe is there's one true value, then there exists no ensemble. To uh, where you can have many, many tries to define this long-term probability of the pro you know for that parameter point. So that's what I mean when I say this quantity just is like not defined in the frequentist way uh, if you don't have like, an ensemble for being able to like tr you know, think about the distribution of the uh, parameter value. You, you would need to be able to con you know you have to to do these long-term frequencies. You need to be able to have many, many trials. So if you have a Universe where there's different patches of the universe where they take on you know different where you know the you know the parameters of nature take on different values then there is actually an ensemble and you can think about this in a in a meaningful way but you would need to like know what that distribution looks like okay is that fine so the so the issue with the so there's this very mathematical notion of probability but it's kind of done at this axiomatic level and, and if you want to use this specific notion of probability in terms of long-term frequencies then you need an ensemble with which to define it and uh, and if you're thinking of in the universe that there's like one particular value the parameters that ex ensemble doesn't exist so you can't even talk about the probabilities for those things it's just that that thing just doesn't make sense yeah
What does it What does it mean to have control over a parameter experimentally? Oh. Yeah, that kind of parameter sounds more like an experimental setting or something like that. Yeah, but I can't I can't change the Higgs mass. Yeah. Um, if you if you, yeah, well, exactly. I mean, if you if you're in a situation where you could control some parameter, uh, and then you, and then and then you just then you get to set the parameter however you want, then you can just build this distribution by hand. You know, like you can just like. So when we, for instance, when we run the simulators, it, to the extent that theta has a, uh, like theta is like a setting in a simulator, and I I pick a value, I run it, and I get some data, and then I can just make up a distribution for the parameters of the simulator and, and draw according to that, uh, and that's like a prior on this parameter. Run the simulator for each of them, and then I build a distribution of what the data looks like, and then that looks just like Bayes' theorem. But the, this distribution is whatever I put in by hand, right? So you can certainly do like Bayesian statistics if you come up with this uh, this prior uh, yourself and you sample it. But uh, but if you're trying to do the statistical analysis where you're thinking like my picture of the universe is that there's one particular true value, uh, then you have a problem with this quantity. Okay. But um, okay, I don't want to. We can talk about that more because philosophical but if you if you're not go, if you don't have this kind of quantity uh, then uh, you're restricted to statements that only use this so it's not going to be of this form so uh, so so now let's try to think about what is the meaning of this contour so when in the LHC experiments when we make these plots they tend to be done in the frequentist way and they're as opposed to the Bayesian way so what is the meaning of these contours in that case it's very similar, but it's a you know subtle rephrasing of the of the statement. So what you're imagining in that situation is there's a true parameter. You don't know what it is. It's it's here. It could, it's somewhere. So you know, pick a spot on. The, think of that as the true value of the parameter. And now. So then you can think about this kind of p of x given you know theta true. I don't know what it is, but I can still think about it. Then imagine doing the experiment many many times, and you know is producing data according to whatever the true unknown value of theta is. So I'm getting uh, different data sets each time, and then I imagine kind of the the function you know contour <laughs> you know contour. Right, so that's this random object. So every time I get new uh, a new data set, the contour is moving around, and what I want is that um, is that that contour includes uh, theta true. That the probability that the contour includes theta true, um, you know, given whatever theta true, uh, is equal to ninety five percent. So this seems like it's almost the same statement, right? Right. But what's happening here is that I'm saying, you know, the, you know, pick a value of theta and consider it to be the true one. Use it, you know, to generate a bunch of data. Imagine it's generating the the data, and each time I get some data, I'm going to make a contour, and then I can just ask, is the that particular value of theta true in the contour? Yes or no. And the probability here is happening. Because you're doing, you're you're taking expectations with respect to the random data. So this is a totally valid expectation to take. And so, if if the contour, co you know, contains the true value, then this this is this is called, you know, this is, you say the contour covers, uh, the you know the true value, and then this this probability is is called the uh, coverage probability, uh, or just you know. In short, people just say coverage again, but um, you know the coverage probability, and and then usually the way it's done is you want it to be you know greater than or equal to 95 percent, because sometimes if you have discrete data, you can't make it be exactly equal. So this is kind of the conservative side. You want it to be at least 95 percent. So the way that that the frequentist confidence intervals uh, work, the guiding principle is this notion of coverage. And then the thing here is this also. To this uh, statistical decision theory is that I don't know what theta true is, right? So I need this thing to be, tr this statement to be true for all 
uh, values of, you know, so I could kind of take off theta true and, and make it be just theta. And it needs to be true for all values of theta. And now this seems like uh, very hard to arrange because if I don't know where, where you know, theta true is, you know, how am I going to come up with a procedure that's always going to satisfy this property? Like that seems hard, right? Like if I knew what theta was, I could imagine building something. But if I don't know what theta is, I need to come up with a procedure for making contours that has this coverage probability for, it, for everything. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's basically what what you're saying. So the and then so I can say oh I, uh, Mr. Right, yeah okay I have like just enough time. So so the uh, yeah so it seems at first it seems kind of like it would be impossible or like it seems almost you know how would you do it? The other thing you could do is think about like how would you check it right? The way you would check it is more obvious. You would go to some you know pick a random value of theta, um, generate a bunch of data, apply the apply the procedure, uh, see if it covers or not, and then, you know, yes or no, and then just do that, for, scan around theta and check, right? And so the thing is, though, what's nice here is that you can think about how would I go about checking if the property is true to use it as the guiding principle for how you're going to make the procedure in the first place. Uh, so there's a procedure um, for making contours that covers, quote, by construction, um, which is called the Nyman construction. Um, So the idea, let's see if I can, uh, um, okay, so if this is my data x, this axis, and this axis is p of x given theta, uh, then I can pick a particular value of theta, um, like uh, let's pick this one right here. Let's imagine that this is, you know, here's theta. It could be kind of the true value of theta. Um, we could, for, for well, I'll, I'll write theta true for now, okay? Um, so here's like my little axis. Um, and now I'm going to imagine some distribution for x, right? If I can find uh, a region um, in, in, uh, in x where this is, you know, kind of, you know, holds 95% uh, of the probability, so if, if this prob so so if I have uh, p of you know of uh, x in um, I'll write it something like this w of theta um, uh, given theta equals you know ninety five uh, uh, percent you know something like that so this is this region is what I mean uh, by w of theta right. Um, then, you know, if this particular value of theta, so, um, so what I'm going to do is that if the data falls in this region, then I'm going to accept that value of theta. I'm going to say this value of theta is consistent with the data, and it's going to be part of my confidence interval, okay? So, um, so, so I'll say that, uh, um, so my, my confidence interval is a function, you know, where I give it some data is going to be uh, the set of thetas such that, um, X is in W of theta. Okay. Um, now I do this for all the different values of theta. So here's like another value of theta, you know, and it has like a different distribution associated to it. I find a different, uh, you know, W of theta. So I have this region, and then there's, a, you know, there's another theta over here, and I find a, a region, you know, so that's the W of theta for that. And I take all of them and I stitch them together. All right? I get this. All these different, for every value of theta, I have a, uh, this, uh, this region of X's that are going to be considered consistent with the data, right? Okay. Is that fine? So now I get some actual data. I do my experiment, I get some specific data. Um, and uh, um, oops, I should not have drawn that that way. Uh, that's too bad. Sorry. 
annoying. Uh, I get some specific data. Um, let's say it looks like that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, then uh, let's imagine that going off out there. Um, then my so I've got I've got some you know some specific data. So x not. So I'll write you know x not here. Um, then what I'm going to do is consider all these different values of, uh, of theta. So here's a value of theta. Um, what do I want to do? I go up here. There's some value of theta. The x is not sitting inside this, uh, this thing, right? So this, this w of theta, this thing is called the uh, confidence uh, belt. Okay. Um, so the, the data x is not inside the confidence belt uh, for this value of theta. So this point's not going to be included. Do, 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 do. This one works. So then you know I'll say okay this one, this is good. This is a particular value of theta where I'll say you know we're good. Um, and then I keep going. We're inside the confidence belt. Inside the confidence belt. And then I leave the confidence belt again here. You know, and so I have a kind of a theta you know plus and a and a theta minus which are used for uh, making my confidence level. Now, if I, got different, if I got a different data set, like the data is fluctuating, right? It's moving around. Every time I get a different uh, set of data, I, do make this, uh, I take this slice again, and my confidence interval is going to move around, right? But then I can just, uh, um, so this is a procedure for making confidence intervals. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a painful procedure, but you can do it. Um, and now I can ask, um, pick any value of theta that you want. Or you can pick any value you want. So I can just choose this value that I started with and think that that's the true value of theta. What is the chance, can, you know, will it satisfy this property? Pick some value of theta, that's this one. I'm gonna imagine generating data from that value. So it's, it's following this distribution here, All right? It's following this distribution. 95% of the time, the data is going to, you know, uh, fall somewhere between here and here, and if it falls between here and here, it's sitting inside of the, this uh, W of theta interval. So this value of theta is going to be included, right? So, I mean, it's kind of a tri it's kind of a trivial statement. Like it's a uh, it's sort of confusing and not, but it's uh, you know by construction, uh, this procedure is going to cover the true value 95% of the time. Um, and so we made something that works for all values of theta, and it does what I want. So I don't know if that was really tricky. I can say it again. But you can pick any value of theta you want. Like, say, this is the value of, of theta. 95% of the time, you know, the data is going to fall between here and here. If it does fall between here and here, then, it's going, then this value of theta is going to be included in my confidence interval. And so it's going to cover it. So I'm good. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, it's always going to happen. So there's a chance, for instance, like if I look at this one, the, the data could have fall out here. So 5% of the time, it's going to be outside of the region. Then when you do the intersection, the confidence interval is not going to cover the true value occasionally. But that's you want, you know, that's supposed to happen, basically. And uh, so the statement is not that the that the uh, the true value is like inside with some, you know, with some probability, it's a statement about how the interval covers, right? Okay, is that, is that fine? So one thing that's interesting here is that, that I, I should say is that when I drew this acceptance region, this W of theta, I just drew it kind of pictorially. I just picked from here to here, but there's a whole different bunch of different ways that you could do it, right? I could kind of integrate from the left, I could integrate from the right, I could try to, uh, you know, t take contours of this thing until uh, I get 95%. I could do, I, you know, there's an infinite family of ways of, uh, of uh, making these, these uh, regions. And so, uh, so you need something called an, uh, an ordering rule, uh, which says basically which values of x are you going to take first. You know, and you keep integrating x until you have 95%. And so that ordering rule is what uh, sort of specifies the, spe the specific way of making this interval. So, um, uh, and the, uh, and so for instance, if you want to do upper limits or lower limits, you might uh, approach different things. If you want to, you know, make two-sided limits, you do it a certain way. Um, uh, th the other point here though is this picture, 
uh, if you have high dimensional data, and if you have high dimensional, it's also kind of a nightmare. So if you have a high dimensional data space, you're going to need to figure out how to like draw this weird contour and high dimensional data, right? And so how are you know how are you going to go about, it, right? So the uh, so the the very last thing that I'll say is that. Um, we also, where else did we talk about trying to make decisions uh, in X space when X is high dimensional? I'll, I'll give you a, a reminder. I was talking about uh, little circles and pluses for like a null and an alternate hypothesis. And I was making, right? And I even called this region W. And when I was doing uh, simple hypothesis testing between two different hypotheses, the way that I chose the, the in this space was the X space, right? The way that I chose the space was through a likelihood ratio, right? I said P of X given, you know, H1 over P of X given H naught was bigger than K alpha, right? So this, this K it was some contour, and I adjusted the contour to be able to get my like 95% or 5% or something like that. So this was a, a nice way of ordering high dimensional data, right? And, and, uh, and it was optimal if you're doing simple hypothesis testing. So in this situation, it's not simple hypothesis testing because instead of just two hypotheses like theta naught and theta one, I have a whole like continuum of, of, of hypotheses to deal with, right? So the generalization of this thing is to say uh, P of X given some particular value of theta that I'm considering. So like I go to some particular value of theta that, that, I'm, that I want to uh, consider. Um, you know, so this is like the, you say the value that you're testing uh, over uh, P of uh, X given some other value of theta. And one option here is to do theta hat maximum likelihood estimate uh, of, of X. So you get your data, you, 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 you can imagine you know, scanning along theta and trying to find the best fit value of theta. So one of these values of theta, you know, somewhere in here is uh, theta hat you know, maximum likelihood estimate of X, right? So that's some particular value of theta. I think of that as like my, my reference hypothesis. That's the very best point, right? So in, in this plot, this is, this is theta hat of, of x, you know, in maximum likelihood estimate, this point right there. That's the best value. And so now I'm going to start considering likelihood ratios with respect to that point. Like I definitely want to accept that point. That's the best fit. So I'm going to start moving away from it and look to see how different is it. So, um, so then I, now I have two competing hypotheses. I have the best one, and then I have the one that I'm considering. And, f and now that I have those two specified, I have this likelihood ratio. And this is uh, um, if I do uh, you know, bigger than uh, k alpha, and I think about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the x's. Uh, uh, such that this condition is true, right? This is, makes a big set. And this is uh, equal to W of uh, theta test of this, this, uh, this thing right here. That's, so that's how you build it. That's a, a specific way of finding the, this critical region or building the confidence belt. Um, uh, so this is a very specific way of building a confidence belt. Um, which is uh, has lots of kind of nice optimal properties. And this is what's called the uh, uh, the Feldman uh, cousins, uh, uh, you know, whatever technique or something like that. So the Feldman, uh, so Feldman and cousins are two physicists actually that uh, that that uh, that sort of published a paper presenting this technique. And when they got done with the with their paper. Uh, you know, they like talked to some friend of Gary Feldman's down the hall at, in Harvard in statistics, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's probably that's like kind of the the, the standard that you would do." But you know, like statisticians are, you know, usually they develop all of this for a very specific model, and then they like work out all the algebra, and they come up with something that doesn't look like a generic recipe. It looks like a, here's a bunch of formulas for a particular model. 
But if you wanted to think of it in kind of generically, like given a statistical model, what should you do? This is like a, a kind of general purpose procedure, right? And uh, and so um, so actually, very many people have done this prior to the to the physicist in a general way. So in some sense, they deserve a lot of credit, you know, for for doing this. But so this is this is how a lot of confidence intervals are made. And then I'll uh, in the last lecture, I'll talk about. I guess kind of my contribution to this, which is how do you do it? What, like in this situation, all of the parameters of the model are parameters that you care about. Um, what do you do if you have uncertainties? Um, and so, uh, how do you do these these confidence intervals with uncertainties? Was uh, some stuff that I did when I was like a, a, a post. Okay, great. Thank you. If anyone wants to ask questions, either now or yeah.